today, as I didn't say, I will try to talk briefly about the functional ecology. I hope um, yeah, not to make it too uh, heavy. But as uh, I didn't said, just for the people that you, uh, of course, many of maybe don't know me, uh, as she said, I'm, I did the PhD in Spain, then I went for many years in Sweden, actually, and then I came back. Uh, I think just mentioning that because most of the things I will present are actually results we got in Sweden. Uh, some time ago already, but uh, not too too long. So uh, today's seminar will be about uh, functional ecology, and I'll, I will try to to at least to explain you why I think this is a cool angle that we could be taking more in in forest pathology, and also uh, just to briefly introduce some concepts. So maybe I also um, let's see. I attract your attention and you also want to join to do these sort of studies, which I think they are quite, yeah, they be quite, how to say, rewarding, that would be the word, uh, in terms of results. And then I will just give you, because not this is not a lecture, I don't want to bore you too much, so I will just give some examples of uh, research that we have done, applying a bit this point of view, and, and then maybe some conclusions, but uh, that will be pretty much it. So I think we can all agree that uh, <clears throat> just an introduction, I forgot one star that on top of Japan, but that's not nothing to be worried about. Uh, I, I think we can all agree that uh, I would say as forest pathologists, we are faced uh, with the normal complexity of our work in our universities, but also um, uh, sort of the, we are facing a lot of changes that they affect forest health, right? And I think if we could agree that uh, um, there are three of them, this uh, globalization with this bringing new pathogens and well, this exchange uh, of materials that they are quite dangerous, but also climate change that maybe it's making some, some pathogens that before we were finding in, in some areas, now they can expand to new, new places. And then we also have land use changes. So yeah, so th this is the situation nowadays. We are many changes. And, and I think we are all asked, uh, well, especially when we talk with colleagues that they are not forest pathologists, uh, questions like, okay, but tell us which pathogens will increase damage with climate change? This is a normal question. And at least myself, the, the phase I do is like that because uh, really to be honest, uh, it's very hard to make these general statements and if I have a sharp day, then I will answer, I will mumble something. Well, it depends, basically because I don't know. And if I'm really sharp, then I would tell him, but look, for example, there are like 124 invasive pathogens in Europe. So how can we make a, a general conclusion about them or a, there's some, a general prediction about them? And then when you mentioned 124, but imagine how many native they are, then this is the phase that the, the person to ask the question. So we are all very confused about our short conversation and um, perhaps not very, yes, it didn't, was not very productive, let's say. And the same, I think, problem uh, occurs when we try to uh, ask, okay, will this pathogen increase damage with climate change? And as a research, we immediately say, okay, we need to study this and that, but imagine there's a pathogen, we cannot do experiments. And then we, it's also very hard to give these sort of answers. And I think at least my opinion is that in, in not only in forest pathology, but in, in many fields of microbial ecology, we are lacking this ecological theory. We, we don't have really a strong theoretical framework that we can make uh, predictions, but we are very good at producing lots of data. I think uh, if you read this paper from James Prosser, I think you can basically change every place that says, microbial ecology by forest pathology. And I think we could all agree with what it says. So why do we need uh, theory? At least to be able to address something as big as uh, the amount of fungi that we can find in a shoot. So when we do metabar coding on a shoot, we will find 188 species, something like that. And theory will help us to, to say, okay, to how we organize this diversity, how we structure it in a way that we can get some mechanistic insights. So what do they do, this, this finding here? And especially when we want to make predictions, to, trying to answer uh, the, the previous questions. 
this, uh, um, so to say, the, the first one we, yeah, the first thing we do when we 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 find a pathogen is we try to put it in boxes. That's the way we sort of organize things. And if you look at pathogens, uh, I think the way we divide them, they are it's like maybe it's originating from some old books like uh, Paul Mannion's three disease concepts and shoot and foliage and vascular and root rods. And also this uh, makes also that we are divided in the youth from meeting, so we all meet in different places and. Yeah, so uh, the question is wh whether this categorization helps us making predictions uh, in terms of, for example, global globalization, climate, and large use changes. Is this something that it's helping? Well, I don't know, and somehow yes, but uh, perhaps we can shift a little bit our uh, mindset, and that's what we sort of proposed in this um, article, and it's using a bit more this functional ecology uh, view. Mm, so what is functional ecology? Functional ecology is basically a branch of ecology that uh, it's focusing a lot on the role that uh, species play. And basically it, uh, sort of the main advantage of that is that it, it aims at reducing the complexity of uh, big communities. And we want to group organisms by functions and this we do it by identifying what is so-called functional traits, which I will talk a little bit. And if we are very audacious or brave, then we can even go and try to do some sort of reverse ecology where we will just use the traits to predict what happens. And this is something um, some of us, we might be interested in doing, for example, doing, using marker genes. And it's done, it has been done a lot in the with prokaryotes, where actually the species uh, tell less than actually the genes. Okay, so this is the, basically the, the, I could finish my talk here almost, but I will yeah, <laughs> entertain you for uh, some, some more time. But uh, then, uh, so how do we do this in practice? So this is, uh, for example, some trees that died, and they died uh, not so far from where I am here now, and they died basically mainly because of drought. So. One way to look at this would be to, to look at different trees in the stage of dying and look at the microbial community and how this changes over this uh, death process. And normally, I think 99% of the papers we see these days, they, they would work with alpha diversity. So they will look at the different species or beta, beta diversity, more looking at compositional changes. But there's a new way of doing things, so there's also an extra possibility that is doing the, uh, what is functional diversity. And functional diversity is basically the same. It's hopefully there's not really a strong ecology here, but it's almost the same as doing alpha diversity. It has almost the same um, indices, like you can have functional richness, functional evenness, and functional divergence, which are very much similar to species richness, species evenness, and so on. So Basically, the, the whole point of this is to, to reduce the community to, to one trait that may we feel maybe this is of interest. And here you have different examples. So this, it would go that you have a lower functional richness because the amount of, in this case, it's a plant. So the nitrogen in the leaf is very narrow. And here it's also very wide, but there's a part where there is none. So this is not so evenly distributed, this trait in this community. And here you have it very even, but then you can have it also uneven. So this would show you that there are some spaces that they are not filled for whatever reason. Then you can also have like uh, other ways of looking at these uh, differences. So you can have like uh, very uh, big diversion. So it, it looks like you have, for example, in this community, you could have two marked strategies, like having very low, or very high nitrogen. But on the other hand, maybe you can have like a convergence so maybe this is also represents a, a gradient. Maybe this is what happens, let's say, in, in very fertile areas, and this is in less fertile areas. So basically looking at these uh, changes in the, the diversity of the traits, we can understand what is happening. OK, so this is, I know this is very theoretical, but at least, uh, at least for me, it is, uh, how to say, it's, it's good to, to, it was good to, to learn all these things. And so when you talk about traits, this is something that um, you can be a bit naive, like we were when we started working on that. But then you realize that there are many categories of traits. And uh, so you have these response traits. 
and this is how uh, uh, it basically reflects how a species reacts to the environment. And this is very much related to life history traits, related to growth, fecundity, longevity. It also very much related to environmental tolerance and specialization. And this is sort of like the, how to say, the, the standard uh, traits that people would use, but then you have these effect traits, which are the interesting ones, but they are also the hard ones to know, which is basically, uh, you don't uh, describe what you, how you re react to the environment is basically what you do to the environment sort of, right? And then uh, they need to be comparable across the species. And normally there are measures of impact of, on the energy flow. So how you might you affect the carbon or the nitrogen, for example, in a system or how much you sort of, how, how big is your turnover of, of things. So these are, uh, um, how to say, more complex traits, but at the end is what we want to do, right? We want to see how uh, changes end up uh, so having these uh, changes in the effect traits, these changes in the community changes the effect traits, and then we get some impact. So this is in the paper. We have this a bit, uh, perhaps now reviewing it after some years, a bit complex figures, but it, in a way it makes some sense. Uh, and the problem, um, this is adapted from some uh, plant uh, uh, framework. And basically it sort of um, describes the whole process of working as a functional ecology, right? So you have some um, biotic factors, some environment, and then this environment will, depending on the pathogen traits or the, the community uh, traits, this will uh, have, end up, you will end up having a community and this uh, um, community will have some effects that will affect uh, ecosystem uh, functioning at the end. So that's the sort of the process. So if this changes, then depending on this, this will change and then it will change also the effects. So that's basically it. Here, the, the, how to say, the challenge is how to integrate, uh, uh, the pathogens are very much uh, in, in, how to say, intermingled with uh, the trees and the vegetation. So is how to introduce them. And in the article, we just simply mentioned that we could include um, pathogens as the environment of the trees, basically, and then say, for example, that the trees grow less because they have some pathogen, and then this affects the ecosystem functioning. Or we can include um, uh, trees as part of the pathogen environment. So that's pretty much it, the, the, sort of the, the, the thinking behind that. But um, it's, it's just because these two organisms, they are so tightly, um, yeah, they are very interactive, basically. So um, for example, uh, let's think about a, a mortality center of armillaria. So then we could think like, how we think in one way would be like, okay, how forest management, um, sorry, I have to move these uh, favors fruit rods. And this decreases, uh, for example, uh, the carbon assimilation of the forest. And then perhaps you would be interested more in, in pathogen traits here to, to sort of model this process. But also we can think uh, like in root rot decreases the tree growth and this is uh, sort of uh, decreases the carbon assimilation. So it's, it's putting more focus on the trees basically. But we can also um, do them both. So we can, uh, yeah, we can use the effect traits to be part of the environment. So, and then of the trees, for example, or the effect traits of the trees to be part of the environment of the pathogen. So we can make it as complex as we want, but um, basically here, the goal is to end up having some effect traits that we can make predictions of. And here's the big question. So can you see traits in microbes? And uh, when you look at the Petri plate and when looking like that, possibly most of people would say no, but uh, we are pathologists and microbiologists. And I think we are, uh, know how to look at very tiny changes in things. And, and actually the, this was uh, the first time I heard about functional traits this was in a lichen uh, thesis they were talking about. If, and I really thought like if people working with lichens could uh, talk about functional traits in pathologies, we could also do it. I had perhaps, I'm saying that because perhaps I had a very sort of, uh, sort of <laughs> high view on what traits were. And actually you can use uh, pretty simple things to do as traits. Mm. 
what type of traits uh, there are. There are also like different uh, levels of uh, coolness, one would, would say. So we have the soft traits, and these are like the morphological traits. Like, and this is what I think they are uh, very, they are quite available, uh, I would say, and they are mostly part of the descriptions of the species. And we use them the surrogates of the function. So if you have uh, like a thick fur like these uh, folks, or you have uh, some spikes. Um, but then what really is, is in, how to say, what people working with functional ecology really like is the heart rates that they are really uh, capture the target function and are usually, as I say here, characterized by experimental manipulation. And I think here is where we have this good opportunity as, as for pathologies is because uh, we work with fungi and these can be manipulated. So we can do experiments, we can let them grow with different temperatures and we don't have to see how, uh, yeah, well, how thick is the fur for, for resisting uh, temperatures. We can just put it in a, in a freezer and see if it survives basically. So this is something like, I would say is more an opportunity for us. So, after this uh, brief introduction, um, I would uh, let's revisit this uh, scary question that I put at the end: which pathogens will increase damage uh, with climate change? And this is a little bit what we tried to do some years ago, and and perhaps uh, we sort of divided these big questions, like uh, saying, like, okay, first we will try to understand what pathogens are restricted by climate, and then perhaps we do the 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 impact. If you remember before, it would be more working on this uh, yeah, this this sort of traits here, the response trait, trying to analyze this system for, from the response traits, and then perhaps to do later the effect traits. Okay, so uh, we know, for example, that the, why we think is important this question is we know that some of uh, some pathogens are actually expanding their the range. It's quite uh, interesting and also uh, worrying what is happening in Northern Europe, where we have this uh, Diplodes opinion, for example, which is quite a, a clear example. Um, but we wanted to work with uh, phytophthores at the time. And, and we wanted to see exactly how uh, climate was uh, sort of, yeah, correlating with the distribution of these uh, phytophthores. So we did quite of a simple uh, experiment. So we went in a, in a gradient with lots of plots and then we were filtering water and we were yeah, basically obtaining what phytophthoros we would get. And by looking at the rivers like this, we tend to assume that we get both the, the phytophthor species that live in the water and they sort of never leave the river with the phytophthor species that also live in the land. So we could sort of sample both at the same time. Why phytophthoras are so cool? I don't know, really. This is so, much, so many people are really, very really interested in them. But one thing that makes them uh, quite interesting is, um, at least for functional uh, ecologies, they are very well annotated. So whenever a new phytophthora is published, you have this very thorough description of uh, morphological traits. And they also have some sort of hard traits, like what is the growth of the species uh, in in a petri plate or in different media. So you, you have lots of information that, that you can use. And that's what we did. So we basically did a very brief search and, and, and we could immediately find some interesting uh, traits, like different types of reproduction modes and yeah, the persistence of sporangia, whether well, they have these uh, survival structures, like these are uh, sexual survival structures that the pathogens that they may be used to survive in, in, in harsh conditions. And we have this sort of environmental tolerance and specialization. So there was lots of information in these um, descriptions that end up being like a big matrix of traits that we use for our analysis. And that's what we got. So we got very distinct um, uh, patterns between what was uh, phytophthoras living in the land or normally living in the land which uh, basically what we could see is that both species richness and functional richness will increase in areas with more rainfall. So that was quite clear. While uh, for aquatic species, we could see that uh, actually we were finding a contrary uh, say, pattern with temperature. So in colder areas is where we would find like more species and more functional uh, 
richness. Okay, I think this would have been pretty much uh, like uh, like most of the studies, so we would end up, end up here. And but uh, we wanted to, then it's when this functional approach came. And what we did was to okay, you have all the species, and then you sort of you you make them into one value. And this value is called a community weighted mean, and this is done for each one of the traits. And basically, this shows for each uh, sample or river in this case, what is the dominant trait? What is the dominant trait here in this area? What is the dominant trait here? I'm saying this is very simple. So it's basically taking the most, the most multiplying by relative abundance of the species. So then by doing like this, we could see quite the interesting patterns. So for example, we could see that the phytophthora that were living in this area, the, the most dominant trait was to, uh, not to have uh, resistant structures, while the phytophthora living in this area, they tended to have uh, structures. And this was showing already some, some pattern here. So having structures very most important in how you were distributed in the land. But then we also looked at, uh, for example, temperature, and we find a similar pattern. So um, when we look at the optimal growth temperature of a phytophthora, and this is again, this is something that we look on a battery plate in a relatively fast experiment, we can see that this is sort of, uh, of course, there is some variation, but uh, it predicted quite well uh, the distribution. So things that were growing better in 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 warmer areas, we will find them here, and and you know, colder areas in the cold areas. So. Yeah, that was uh, matching quite well. And then we even went a bit into other uh, more qualitative things, but uh, we could think that, for example, um, pathogens or phytophthora that were found in these colder areas tended to be more those that only attacking the roots. While when we were find here in, in, in I would say in, in warmer areas, then we would see how the pathogens also these phytophthora tended to attack higher parts of the, of the tree. So that maybe was telling us that, yeah, if you go to, to, yeah, to warmer or wetter areas, that it's more possible for you to, to, to colonize other organs of the trees. That maybe looks so very obvious, but at least it's interesting to have some data to back up such things. Um, th then after this, you have this, uh, okay, this is so interesting why, uh, yeah whatever, this all makes sense, we're all very happy. But uh, it, then you realize that the cystatic distribution of species is quite a, a complex uh, area and, and there's lots of people that they do that very well. So, and, and if there is one at least uh, alternative hypothesis to how species are distributed, is this difference between the fundamental and realized niche. And is, is that wherever you are, it doesn't mean that it's only the environment that is uh, um, preventing your distribution, is you might have some competitive uh, factor. So maybe you have a, a competitor in, in that area. That's why you cannot reach that cold to warm area, not because you, you basically, you cannot be there. So, and that's actually true if you, <laughs> This is also, uh, of course, it's a possibility. And as, a, yeah, as a many of you know, sometimes it's not so easy to discard uh, these possibilities. But the, in our case, we were uh, actually part of this uh, thesis of Miguel Angel, which I haven't mentioned, but most of this work is the thesis of Miguel Angel Redondo. And, and also John Standard uh, contributed quite a lot on this. But uh, yeah, so all, all the credit should go to him. Sorry, I should have mentioned him. At first, but so actually, when we started working with Miguel Angel, we started working with uh, Phytophthora alni, and I think this was quite of a, an interesting pathogen because, well, first we didn't know very much where it was in Sweden, and we, we end up looking everywhere basically, and this looking everywhere made sort of into a map, so we could basically know where this pathogen was and where it was not, and this pathogen actually is, is a it has like. It's not a pathogen, it has actually a species complex, it has two species, and uh, Phytophthora alni and Phytophthora uniformis. And these two species are interesting in, 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 in one way, because one of them is very sensitive to, to low temperatures, and this is uh, Phytophthora alni. And then actually, when you look at the map, you can really see that Phytophthora alni, it's uh, much more, it's very much restricted to the coastal areas in Sweden, so where it's not 
as you can see here, the average temperature is sort of like never, um, yeah, sort of around zero degrees. So it's, it's never really freezing or not, not so often as in the other parts. While you have these other species, Phytophthora uniformis, it is spread all over uh, Sweden. And he, but here it comes a question. So is it uh, the, the climate or is it the competitive exclusion? So in this case, we can be quite sure that is the climate. Why? Because we know that this one that is restricted is, the, is more pathogenic. So if climate would not be uh, really affecting, this would have possibly taken over the other one. So the reason that the less pathogenic or the less fit is covering this area, it must be because it can't resist the, the frost or the cold. Okay, so this to me is one a good example of uh, like being quite sure that this climate what is restricting this this pathogen and not competitive exclusion. But of course, this may be the only case where we are sure. But it's, so you can have many others where it it won't be so easy to tell. But I just wanted to show one that you could tell. So how how can we test this? So is this is there a way to test this? Well, actually, there is one way. And there is one way, which is, and uh, what you need to do is to uh, basically, um, uh, you have your the species here, and then you have the, the sort of, sort of, sorry, the functional uh, diversity and the diversity, and these are very much connected. So the more species, more traits, that's uh, for sure. So, but then you can have like some sort of like expectation of that. So this is this black line, and this uh, gray line is what sort of the, and your uncertainty. So what happens is that if you see that for a given number of species of frictionists, you have less functional diversity than what you would expect by random, then you can be sort of, uh, yeah, you can, this can indicate that there's some sort of environmental filtering. There's some traits that if you have those, you cannot live here basically, right? So that's one way of testing. And maybe it's not as neat as the one with the Phytophthora only that I just mentioned, but at least this is something we can, yeah, we can use. And in the other hand, on the other hand, if we have competitive exclusion, then we would have like higher uh, the functional diversity than expected by the number of uh, species. Okay, so that's so that at least there's some hope there, so we can use it. And this is a little bit what we looked in the terrestrial and the aquatic community. So we could see that terrestrial communities uh, were less rich than uh, sort of the, the <laughs> we had many more cases where they were below this threshold so that we could see signs of uh, uh, environmental filtering so in 20 percent of the plots while in it was only in, in three percent of the plots that the ones with the, the aquatic community so yeah okay we could think that uh, perhaps uh, living in the land is not as uh, nice as living in the water and uh, at least gives us some some indication of how these two communities sort of interact with the environment. So more examples of, uh, so this is what's about uh, climate, but we will re revisit this, this thing. So more things about uh, some places, other places we have looked at this functional way. So if you look at, I guess you know that the, the, this invasion pathway that you have, the, you assume that invaders to come into a place, they have to cross some barriers. And so that's what we did also in this, uh, in the thesis of Miguel Angel. And, and we basically, what we saw that was that the phytophthora richness was going down. So we look at the species that we have in the nurseries that they are, of course, they are sold somewhere. So they are planted in the, in the environment. Then we would go into the natural forest and we would see that the number was much less. So what has happened to all those species that have been lost? And more important, what traits do they have, these species that they've been lost? So one of the important traits that we saw was that, for example, when we were looking at nurseries versus the forest, we could see that in the nurseries, so the 50% of the species had these resistance structures. While if we were going to the forest, then almost 80% had it. So that looks like an important trait if you want to invade the forest in Sweden. And then when you make it together, then uh, you join the, the invasion and the climate thing. Then you can also get, you see some, some common patterns. So 
And then you see that, for example, to establish in the forest is important to have resistant structures, but to spread in Sweden also in, in colder and drier areas, it's important to have uh, resistant structures. And the same with the, the lower optimal temperature, you know, so it looks like a, compared to the ones in the nursery, the ones that established it had lower. So what does it mean? What we can uh, interpret this as uh, it is important to be able to resist cold, to, to, to invade, uh, to be like an invasive pathogen in Sweden. Perhaps this was very obvious, but at least we have some data to back it up. And more importantly, this is not something that affects one species. It's something that seems to affect like a, a big group of pathogens. Just to tell you a little briefly what we are doing now, we're having this uh, big uh, gradient across uh, Europe, and we are looking at the same questions, but uh, which might, you know, broader temperature and, and winter and, and Sort of rainfall uh, values, and basically we are we are seeing very much the same. We we see that, that winter temperature is very important, so this cold it seems to be a, a great barrier for this sort of species. And then we have identified some key traits that they can sort of be they are able to predict this uh, distribution. And I think the one well, I have to sell a bit our. Uh, Maria's uh, paper is, is that we are testing this hypothesis in both an altitudinal and a latitudinal grade. So uh, this will be uh, finished soon. More things that we that we have done in this sort of functional point of view. So when another research, what we did was to look at uh, what species we were finding in the forest and what species we were finding in in, in recreational forests to see if this. Uh, was sort of like a, yeah, we could blame the tourists going to the forest basically that they are bringing the phytophthora or maybe they are a bit disrupt, disturbing the, the environment. But so what we did was to, to again, here we took many species uh, we, we need, that we know that they are present and then we did inoculation tests. Those inoculation tests, basically we, we converted them in traits. So we knew how pathogenic and how specific were these different um, phytophthora species. So then we can sort of get these results. So what did we get? We, get, we saw that uh, in areas with a lot of human influence, the, the species that we were finding or the species that we were, were not finding were not different in terms of pathogenicity, but we could see that they were very different in terms of specificity. So um, it looks like uh, specificity, being specific is sort of a key trait to invade a uh, given forest through this, uh, recreational activities right okay it this is a paper still we with uh, under preparation but uh, at least i think it illustrates a bit uh, what we are I'm trying to say and finally i would just quickly talk about something similar with it it's like uh, we 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 did it with this diplodius opinia and we have this uh, defoliations here not so far from here related to hail damage after this hail storm then you get this brown forest and what we looked was at the different trees uh, that they had displayed more or less symptoms. We knew that uh, they are, well, had all been damaged by hail, but some really seemed to be not care so much. And then we, um, yeah, because we did metabar coding on the shoots, and then we, we also did some isolation on the endophytes. We isolated the Claudia. And basically, again, we sort of did this experimental an annotation. Basically, we were growing the endophytes in different um, medias to see if they like more uh, nitrogen or proline or, uh, yeah, or this. they were growing this minimal media just to see how, which sort of resources they were capturing and how fast they were capturing and how much they were increasing in biomass a little bit. This, yeah. Annotation. So what we could see is that, uh, in fact, the, the, this, this diplodius opinia here, this was outside the hailstorm. So we, we took also some control trees. And the asymptomatic and the symptomatic trees, we could see that in both uh, diplodia had increased. So they, they we're quite sure that they have suffered this um, hail, but it was much less in the asymptomatic. And then by looking at the communities, we could see that um, this is sort of the distribution, the segregation sort of randomized. And, and we can see if the segregation of our uh, communities is uh, outside this plot, it means that it has more segregation. And segregation can be used as an indication of competition. So we could see that 
it looked like there was some competition going on in these asymptomatic trees that we would not find in the symptomatic trees. And yeah, this was, this was quite a long paper, but it was linked to some cluster of endophytes. And then we could see that this, the presence of this cluster was really correlating in, across four fine species with less uh, diplodia. And we could see that the, uh, the, tree, the trees that were having this cluster were uh, the communities there tended to be sort of more adapted to this, having this fast capture of carbon and nitrogen. And this could imply that after a hail storm, they had this sort of interference strategy, so sort of they occupied the space fast. And, and then they also were um, able to, to use better, like a proline there as a nitrogen source, they would accumulate more biomass, some trait, okay then we can interpret or not. But this was the sort of, um, was a way to reducing this complexity of uh, hundreds of endophytes into some functions. So um, almost done. But I think it's, um, at least uh, when we were writing this paper with Jan, we, we realized that uh, there wasn't so much done on the actual role of the pathogens. What do they do in nature? So why are they important? Besides the economical part, what is their ecological role? And, and I think a lot could be, how to say, we could learn a lot if we could think more like this functionally sort of like, and I think uh, where well, we propose some part that could be more developed, but uh, looking at root rods, for example, right now recently I started working with root rods and these uh, forest gaps. And I think this is quite amazing. I don't think there are so many organisms that can create this sort of like, they can renew the forest as they do, as the forest pathogens do. And well, the way that that interfere with forest growth and the uh, mycorrhizal, so it's quite amazing, I think. And, and no one has looked at that basically. Then for example, the pathogens, they affect these nitrogen fixing species in the rivers, this older, for example, this is important. And I, I myself didn't know that it was so important for nitrogen and the leaves are very nice for the fishes and, and this, so uh, all, the, all things that can be affected by pathogens for example plant soil feedbacks or this kind of pervisionation feedbacks and even this drought induced mortality this was perhaps the first time we started thinking like uh, a bit like that and and this was when trying to interact with some people working with tree mortality and they have the drought very very is very central for them. So they were really asking what pathogens will benefit from drought. And we could make a list, right? But we couldn't not make like a sort of, we weren't so good at grouping them and say like, and then we came up that maybe this drought induced mortality was related to the trophic interaction. So the way they were interacting with carbon and, and, and water. And actually I think it, it, after some years I realized this was quite, a good way of sort of simplifying and, and finding one pathogen and say, look, will these pathogens increase, uh, contribute to mortality if drought increases? Then you can say, yeah, necrotrophs, possibly yes, biotrophs, not so much. Okay. So coming back to the original question, which pathogens will increase damage with climate change? Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> so this was a, I don't know, but at least we can say something with uh, Phytophthora. So I wouldn't make this, uh, uh, let's say, scary face uh, or scared face that I showed you before. But so with Phytophthora, I think we know that, uh, for example, climate is more limiting for terrestrial than, than aquatic Phytophthora species. And, and for example, climate is limiting the distribution of foliar pathogens, so or foliar, sort of foliar Phytophthora. And um, I, sorry, this is a typo here. So, and climate is, would be uh, limiting for these uh, species or that uh, they need this high temperature to grow. So at least we know uh, some species that most likely will not create an impact because they will not be able even to reach these areas that they are sort of protected by the climate. So now what we are doing is try to generalize that. So it, are these patterns really, uh, um, we can also find, find them in, in fungi basically or is this specific from for Phytophthora? So we will try and see if we manage. And for example, uh, going to the second question, uh, is this uh, um, species a, th a threat or will in increase damage in, the, in climate change? And this I think is typical type of questions that they are done in, in April, for example, where you do these peer rates. 
and you have to make predictions about things that you don't have in the country because, for example, there are quarantine species. And okay, so for for uh, Phytophthora ramorum, I think I would say uh, no because it's a foliar pathogen and this would only sort of occur in very small areas. But on the other hand, uh, Phytophthora ramorum has a low optimal temperature and, and has chlamydospores, and these are uh, good traits to to survive in cold weather. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, there. It's not so clear that could not establish. And actually, uh, I think we know that has established uh, at least in Norway, which has perhaps a similar climate to the Sweden, but a bit wetter. Okay, but at least you you know we can use this sort of um, just by looking at the traits, we can make at least some some sort of a prediction. I was also amazed how the diversity of languages you have in South Africa. <laughs> I just said thank you in. I hope they are fine in all of them. Thank you so much. So, um, Yanis, thank you for your great talk. Uh, the one thing I really like about listening to you and chatting to you and interacting with you is that you always challenge us to think a little bit deeper about what we're doing and the situations that we're finding ourselves in. So, if we're looking at um, biological invasions, it's not only about documenting where they are or about the processes, but it's it's also about the genetic traits that might be relevant for invasion of success. And then also, is there a functional role that plays in it? And if there is, then how would that be useful to us as pathologists? Uh, so you, you're always challenging us and, and encouraging us to think big. Um, I really like that. And that's the one thing I also enjoy about uh, paper as well, where you mention things that we could be doing just as we're doing in the lab every day. The thing is, we are very observational in what we do. We might not always record those observations. So, and that I think would be something that we might want to encourage more. One of your suggestions, for example, is when we're doing species descriptions to not only document your optimal temperature, but also to document uh, the the limits, the upper and lower limits of where they would die. And um, so if you had to put them in a, a warmer climate or warmer temperature, then they would not be surviving. Those traits then relating to something that you could be using more usefully in modeling systems. Just in my own observations, when growing ceramicists on a petri dish and doing species descriptions, uh, you have this sort of a recipe that you're following in species descriptions. And so, yes, you write there that the optimal temperature is 25 uh, degrees Celsius for growth. But if you look very carefully at the plates, you will see that the most of the sporulation that's happening is at 20 degrees. So potentially 20 degrees is the one that's the most optimal because you're getting a lot of spore mass production. And those are the kind of things that we should actually be characterizing and, and putting into the papers and those slight observations that people have for the pathogens that they're working on should actually be available and, and put out there. So th those are the, the interesting traits as well. And I know he's online, he found some interesting things with his um, pathogen as well that he's looking at, especially in terms of climate and how changes in climate can also change where the, you have to drop the temperature in order for the fungus to spiralate. So it can be in the environment, but it's not going to be doing anything unless there's a, a distinct climate change. So thank you for that. I see there's some really nice discussion going on in the chat. And so instead of reading it out, I'm going to ask Eki if you are still online to maybe ask your um, question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still online. Um, okay. Yeah. So thanks very much for that really interesting and inspiring talk. And I enjoyed that very much. And so I, I had a comment slash question about the barriers from the Blackburn concept of invasions across stages and so on. And, and you had this nice example of the um, difference in species numbers in nurseries, anthropogenic forests and natural forests and I was just thinking don't you think that there's also this lag phase of invasions that start often in nurseries for plant pathogens and uh, many of them eventually actually are also found in the forest and and eventually also in, in natural forests 
so so don't you think that partly the pattern that you saw is also related to that rather than some other barrier that would prevent them to go further beyond nurseries uh, yes absolutely is a possibility we we actually we tested that and it wasn't really of course <laughs> who knows when species came right this is but we have this first date of description and we know that some are older we can call it that. and and there wasn't really a significant difference in the actually the species that we found in the forest are quite old species so it's like the top three can be well but it's true that perhaps some of the new ones we still haven't got the time to to reach there but apparently there wasn't really a clear um but to say uh, it wasn't as clear pattern as with other uh, traits so but mm -hmm. i can agree these are observational studies and we have the nature that we have and we have to make the best of, of it right and for example that's also one of the reasons we are now doing this altitudinal versus uh, latitudinal gradient is because um we are trying to look at these temperatures in a much more local scale and, and rather than a continental scale. And we hope that we can sort of correct part of this um, lag phase in the in the way that the invaders are spreading. You see what I mean? Because it's much mm -hmm. shorter. And actually, I must t tell you that um, when we look at the, there are many, many species that they have the same sort of response to temperature in altitudinal, latitudinal phase. So really show at least giving more evidences that the time is important, but uh, at least there are some other things that are important too. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Hola, Jonas. Hello. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> Buenos días. Buenas tardes. Um, no, yeah, my comment was just, you know, I thought Iki's hypothesis was interested. And just like you're doing a, um elevational gradient, you could maybe do a gradient from the nurseries and substitute space by time so that the forests that are closer to the nurseries would um, be more likely to have the same species as the ones in the nurseries versus the ones that are further away. Like maybe in Sweden, I think most of the nurseries would be in the southern part of Sweden versus the northern part or something like, I don't know. That's what I was. Yeah, I think it's a good comment. Uh, I mean, um, how to say, uh, th these are very, how to say, uh, simple experiments. And then of course they can be complicated. In the case of Sweden, I think, um, I'm not so sure that the, and it depends on how you, you think that these pathogens are uh, moving out from the from the nurseries. If you think that they are just escaping from the nursery, or it's when you sell the infected plants that they are planted elsewhere, that is when they are sort of um, establishing in the nature. So I don't know, but uh, yes, how to say? Uh, I think. Many things can be tested just using this sort of uh, gradient, and also they have as many problems as you could, you are thinking. And I think now in the new analysis we are doing, we are definitely including this. Um, it's one of the significant parts, like uh, significant factors in the, the temperature. One of the traits that it's really high is this time, for example, time since they were discovered as a species. So, or maybe you could include a variable of population density or something in your analysis. No, absolutely. But this was already done in this, uh, in this new five paper that I mentioned before. So, where these mm -hmm. geographical patterns of invasion, so that, that was done there in a way. So, but um, yeah, so uh, perhaps we are doing a little bit the same, but uh, it, this is more like based on a sampling, not so much on, on records of countries. And so, let's see if we get similar conclusions or not. I think it's still. In process. Great, thanks. And then we've got a question from Miriam. Hi, Jonas. Thanks for your great talk. I read that some hosts play a role in the pathogen persistence for Pachyptera remora rather than being a host to produce the disease. Did you see something like this in your studies? And how relevant do you think this is, host persistence in a study of functional ecology? I think this is quite interesting, but I don't. We don't work at such a small. I think this would be quite of a stand scale, and I think this has been shown quite, as you say, in in Phytophthora rumorum. It's it's very important. A little bit from an epidemiological point of view, right? You have you can have this. It's almost like in this coronavirus, right? You have these asymptomatic uh, people that they are spreading the disease, and so yes, it is. Uh, uh, I could say that, for example, these perhaps could be captured in the how uh, wide is your range of hosts? 
If you have a wider range of hosts, maybe that implies that you can survive in more hosts, and then you can perhaps in not all of them you will uh, cause uh, um, disease, or uh, and then you, so you can jump around and find always you can find a, a nice host. But uh, that's how I would say I would think it's sort of captured in a trait. But I, I, this is a very general trait that could also include many other things. But yeah, definitely it's important as you say. And then Helena asks, what do you think about the impact of Phytophthora romora in Mediterranean countries? Is it a low risk or not? Um, I, I must say that uh, based on the results, of, <laughs> based on our results, it, it, I must say that we get very, very, very few uh, reads of uh, Phytophthora romorum in the river. So this is quite, uh, in comparison to some studies that were done in, in in the states, uh, we get very little. So basically, we can get very little conclusions. But if we assume that uh, that uh, Phytophthora romorum is a foliar pathogen, and this is sort of quite well correlated with having like rain, then I would say that if you if you're living on Mediterranean countries, like a dry Mediterranean countries, then I would think it's not uh, not perhaps the risk is low, but just based on its trait. I must also say that, um, unfortunately, a lot of these studies that we have done, and that's maybe something we should do more, is to actually put numbers on those risks. So, and we haven't done that. So, is, we, I don't know what is the risk. Uh, we could calculate that, but I don't know what is the risk of being foliar or not foliar, the increased risk of being foliar or not foliar. This we haven't done it, unfortunately, but perhaps in the future. So I'm not so sure I'm answering your question, but uh, yeah, based on what this is a foliar, I would say from our data, it shows that you need lots of rainfall, but that would be my, and a bit cold weather, which I'm not so sure is especially Mediterranean. So, um, so Philippe says, hi, Jonas, thanks for the nice talk. I remember you mentioned in your paper, the need and opportunities in using plant-based traits to assess the impact of microorganisms on ecosystems. And I have seen some papers in which you use carbon assimilation. Have you used reproduction rates or other functional traits in this manner? No, no, because we are not measuring so much the community of the host, actually. But it, it is, it's all good ideas. I think they could be done. We haven't done it, especially because what we are... We look at the what we've done so far is to look at the phytophthora in the in river, so there's no actual forest that to to measure all, all such things. Um, but yes, I think it is is all uh, as I, I mentioned before. You can take it from the part of the from the pathogen. You can if you have lots of traits from the pathogens, then you can use it as a pathogen approach, but you could also use it as a forest approach if you have all those data. And you know how, and you have data on how those things change with being having a pathogen or not. So yes, it, it's fine. Great. So um, I think then we can wrap this session up, Jonas. Um, once again, very inspiring, thought-provoking, a challenge to everybody to think a little bit deeper and document these kind of traits as well. Um, think a little bit bigger as to how we look and assessing things. And um, yeah, it's been great to have you here. And thank you once again for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.